And here we are with video 5 covering chapter 2 of your computer systems text. This video will start our coverage on section 4 of chapter 2 on floating points. We'll start with some background on fractional binary numbers and then talk about the IEEE floating point standard. So far we've been talking about integers. In order to add fractional values we'll need to have a binary point. This is just like the decimal point in base 10. To the left of the binary point, our bits are dealt with just like in integers. The weights of the bits are powers of 2, 1, 2, 4, etc. To the right of the binary point, we just have negative powers of 2. So the first bit to the right has a weight of 2 to the minus 1, or 1 half. The next has a weight of 2 to the minus 2, or 1 quarter, etc. So rather than representing our bits as being indexed from 0 to 1, we index our bits from negative j, with j bits to the right of the binary point and the bits from 0 to i to the left of the binary point. This represents a rational number. We just sum the values of the bits times 2 to the k, with k ranging from negative j to i. These examples show the representation of some fractional values. As you can see, the whole number portion is represented to the left of the binary point as usual, while the fractional parts are to the right of the binary point. Again, the weights to the right of the binary point are fractional powers of 2, so in the first example, the fractional portion comes from multiplying 1 and 1 half, and adding that to 1 times 1 quarter, giving us 3 quarters. You can see that the other examples work the same way. Just like with integers, we can do an unsigned division by shifting right, and a multiplication by shifting left. Also remember that numbers in, of the form 0 dot, followed by a string of 1's approach but do not reach 1. We use the 1.0 minus epsilon notation to indicate a number of that form. There are a couple of limitations to the numbers we can represent with fractional binary numbers. First, we can only exactly represent numbers with the form x over 2 to the k. Other rational numbers have repeating bit representations. Some examples are shown here. The bits in the square brackets at the end of each example indicate the bit patterns that keep repeating. Another limitation revolves around the ability to set just one location for the binary point within your word. This limits the range of numbers you can represent. Do we need very large values, very small values, or something in between? Enter the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE. In 1985, IEEE Standard 754 was established as a uniform standard for floating point arithmetic and is supported by all major CPUs. This standard was driven by numerical concerns over hardware concerns, and is great for rounding, overflow, underflow, etc., but it's hard to make fast in hardware. The numerical form is seen here. S is our sign bit, and simply tells us whether the number is negative or positive. M is the significant and has a fractional value in the range of 1.0 inclusive to 2.0 exclusive. The exponent E weights the value by a power of 2, the most significant bit contains the sign bit. The next set of bits, or the EXP field, encodes E, the exponent, and the remaining bits, the FRAC field, encode M. Note that we say encodes because the EXP and FRAC fields encode but are not equal to E and M, respectively. These diagrams show the sizes of the various fields for varying word sizes. Within the standard, we have normalized values, denormalized values, and special values. Let's start by taking a look at normalized values. The value is normalized when the EXP field contains neither all zeros nor all ones. The exponent is coded as a biased value. The EXP field is treated as an unsigned value. The bias is equal to 2 to the k minus 1, minus 1, where k is the number of exponent bits. So, since single precision has an 8-bit EXP field as we saw on the previous slide, the bias value is 2 to the 7 minus 1, or 127. The exponent E is then calculated by subtracting the bias from the unsigned value of the EXP field. Since the EXP field cannot contain all zeros or all ones for a normalized value, the unsigned value can be any integer from 1 to 254 inclusive, which gives us a range of negative 126 to 127 for our E values. The significant is encoded with an implied leading 1, which means that the frac field represents the fractional portion of the significant. The minimum value of the significant is 1.0 when the frac field is filled with zeros, 
and 2.0 minus epsilon when the frac field is filled with ones. So, by assuming the implied one in front of the bits of the frac field, we basically get that extra leading bit for free. So, if we have a float with the value of 15,213.0, let's take a look at how we would encode that as a single precision or 32-bit float. First, let's get it into the right form. The binary point starts out at the end of the bit vector. We'll shift that up to the correct point, which involves shifting it 13 places to the left to get it just after the first one. This is equivalent to shifting the bit vector to the right by 13, which is in turn equivalent to multiplying it by 2 to the 13th. The point of doing this is to separate our representation out so that we have the values of m and e that we need to encode. Remember that we have an implied one point in front of our frac field, so for the m shown, the frac field will be encoded with everything to the right of the binary point. Now we only have 13 digits for this particular number, and we have a frac field that is 23 bits long, so we just pad with zeros to the right to fill up our frac field. Next, we encode the exp field. Remember that our e value is 13, and we calculate e by subtracting the bias from the unsigned value of the bits in the exp field. Because we are using single precision, we know that we have 8 bits in the exp field, which gives us a bias of 2 to the 7 minus 1, or 127. A little bit of algebra tells us that the unsigned value of exp should be e plus the bias, or 140, which translates to 10001100 in base 2. Our original number is positive, so that tells us that the sign bit should be set to 0. Putting all of that together gives us our 32-bit representation of the floating point number 15213.0. Now let's take a look at the conditions for denormalized values. The rules are just a bit different here. We are dealing with a denormalized value only if the exp field is all zeros. In that case, we calculate the value of e by subtracting the bias from 1. This is an easy one to get wrong because for normalized values, we subtract the bias from the value of the exp field, which in this case would be zero. So for denormalized values, we have the value of e by subtracting the bias from one. The significant of a denormalized number is coded with an implied leading zero instead of the leading one we use for normalized values. So for cases where the exp and frac are both all zeros, we get representations of zero values. Note that the sign bit still applies, so we actually have representations for positive and negative zero. This comes from number theory having a lot to do with the standard. While in most cases positive zero, zero, and negative zero are equivalent, the differentiation between positive and negative zero become important for some applications, specifically when working with complex elementary functions, some applications of statistical mechanics, and when dealing with one-sided limits, uh, which just means differentiating between limits approaching zero from the positive or negative sides. What we want to focus on here, though, is that this leads to actually different results for some operation, which you'll see in examples from our special values on the next slide. When the exp field is all zeros and the frac field is not all zeros, we get the values closest to zero. We'll see what this looks like graphically at the end of the video. In situations where the exp field is filled with ones, we have our special cases. If the frac field is all zeros, we have a representation of infinity, either positive or negative, remember. This can be used for operations that overflow. These examples show some operations that end up representing negative or positive infinity. In the case where the frac field is not filled with zeros, we get a case where no numerical value can be determined or not a number. I do want to call your attention to the examples for where the frac field is equal to all zeros. We have some divide by zeros that don't actually end up being not a number. Uh, these are some of those special cases where the positive and negative 0, 0.0 makes a difference. So negative 1.0 divided by negative 0, 0.0 or 1.0 divided by 0, 0.0 both evaluate to positive infinity. Whereas, for example, 1.0 divided by negative 0.0 .0 evaluates to negative infinity. And we'll finish up this video with a simple graphical representation of what these ranges look like on a number line. We have our zeros at the middle, remember they have positive and negative zero, surrounded by denormalized value, which we remember we said are the values closest to zero, 
then normalized numbers bounded by positive and negative infinity, and finally our special case not a numbers are outside of our actual number line. And that does it for this video. In our next video, we'll continue with Chapter 2, Section 4 on floating point numbers.